I hope you can hear me uh, clearly. So, uh, hello everyone, and thank you for participating in this webinar offered by the European School Education Platform, uh, the European Commission's platform on school education in Europe. Uh, my name is Maria Elena, and I will be coordinating today's webinar. And before we begin, I would like to remind you of some technicalities uh, besides uh, of, uh, of that the webinar is uh, being recorded, as I mentioned earlier. I uh, would like to remind you that towards the end uh, of uh, this webinar, we will uh, um, update you on the upcoming learning events on the European School Education platform. And me and my, or my colleague Marta will share with, the, uh, with you uh, a survey which we kindly invite you to fill in. It concerns uh, your feedback uh, about uh, our webinars. And um, so uh, let me introduce you our speaker today. So for this webinar, we have invited uh, Professor Herkel Fontaine. Uh, Mr. Fontaine is an associate professor of, uh, at, the, at uh, the Department of Work and Social Psychology of the Faculty of Psychology and Neuroscience at the Maastricht University. And he has an extensive experience in designing and implementing education with active learning for forms like uh, problem based uh, and challenge based learning and was also involved uh, in the implementation of the global citizen education framework uh, at Maastricht uh, University's curriculum. So today uh, he will help us to gain a better understanding of the concept of global citizenship education by sharing uh, some of his personal experience uh, from the implementation of the relevant framework into the Maastricht University's curriculum. And so uh, with no further delays, um, Mr. Fontaine, you can uh, share your, uh, you can upload your presentation and the floor is yours. Since uh, this might take uh, a bit, um, let me remind to all our participants today that they can share their thoughts, questions uh, through the chat. Uh, we will uh, come back later towards the end of the webinar to reply to you or uh, mention, um, discuss a bit maybe about your thoughts and uh, what uh, you found interesting during this webinar. And um, Yes, uh, Mr. Fontaine, okay. we are waiting. Yes. <laughs> great. Preparing great. the slides. Uh, I hope you can see them. I can see them clearly. I hope our participants can see them as well. Okay. Um, great. Yes. So okay. this is this is the story of uh, the, the past couple of years where we're trying to implement um, aspects of global citizenship education in all the programs here at the university uh, in Maastricht in the Netherlands. Um, and I'm going to um, yeah, present to you first uh, something about what global citizenship education is and then something about what we did to make a start with the implementation and I'll end with some of the key challenges and, and, and solutions that uh, we, we faced. Um, I won't be able to track the chat but feel free to share whatever you have uh, what's on your mind because often what's happening in the chat is just as interesting as the things that are presented um but um i hope you'll bear with me um so the future of education and often global citizenship education is very much indirectly involved in thinking what kind of world we want to leave for for the next generations and what kind of competences the people need our students will need in order to thrive in that world so the, the future is always uh, on our minds and at the moment the future of higher education for instance if you look at unesco and all sorts of policy documents uh, people say Higher education has three missions. It's education, it's research, and it's outreach. And, and the, the lenses through which we should be looking at higher education now, it's, well, education is about developing global citizens who can deal with the complexity of today's world. Research is about sharing knowledge and open science through transdisciplinary approaches, which means interdisciplinary, but also involving outside uh, stakeholders and then social engagement and ethical responsibility. And all these aspects come back uh, when we look at global citizenship education, but uh, that will become clearer later on, I think. For now, um, well, the future, this is an example of uh, Nicole, one of my colleagues, uh, who is a positive psychologist. When you think about the 
future? What kind of world do you want to live in? Um, the, this is an, an exercise you can try at home. Um, take a moment to imagine that all goes well. Everyone contributed to make things work. We managed to deal with the climate crisis and social injustice. Form a concrete image of this world. See yourself in it. Look around. What does that world look like now? Take notice of all the positive things you see. Imagine that. And when you do that afterwards, find someone else and share your best possible worlds with each other. What are the similarities? What would you still want to add to your best possible world when you hear the other speak? This is an interesting exercise because you can do this with people with very opposing views of what the world is now. But when they think of their ideal world, often there are lots of similarities and way to empathize with each other. So a way to to bridge uh, differences. Um, but the question now is, if you think about that world, what is the role of education in creating such a world? You know, what do you have to let go and give up to get there? Again, this is about global citizenship education to, to a large extent, because um, for one thing, what is global citizenship? What is a global citizen? Um, this is one definition. A global citizen is a person developing an identity that is rooted in a particular community, but with a sense of connection and responsibility for people elsewhere. And usually not just the people, also the world. So it's it's not some legally defined membership of a political community, but more a, a state of belonging. And global citizenship, uh, this is a widely quoted definition, also refers to the sense of belonging to a broader human community, sharing a destiny on this planet, which is in addition to other senses of belonging, emphasizes political, economic, social and cultural interdependence and interconnectedness between the local, the national, the regional and the global, and applies a common global responsibility to build a more just, equal, sustainable and peaceful world. So these, these are very lofty goals and there you already see one of the, the, the challenges that once you, if you're a teacher and you're thinking about these lofty goals, how do you make this a reality in your day to day uh, teaching activities? Um, but global citizenship education then uh, is often linked to uh, knowledge of global issues and universal values, values such as justice, equality, dignity, respect, uh, cognitive skills, critical thinking, systems thinking, creative thinking, perspective taking, non-cognitive skills, social skills, uh, socio-emotional skills, think about empathy, uh, listening, communicative interpersonal skills, conflict resolution, uh, being able to um, interact with people with very different backgrounds, and then behavioral capacities to act collaborative and responsibly and to strive for the collective good. This is also related to change agency, the, the ability to make change happen. So these are, these are elements of global citizenship education. Um, but unfortunately, even with these elements, you can have very different approaches to global citizenship. For instance, there's a, a neoliberal human capital approach. And then you focus on these skills and competences because they're important for people who have to thrive in the future labor market. Um, so it's about employability and, and global competitiveness. Um, there's the liberal approach, more say the UNESCO approach, focusing on intercultural understanding and respect and social justice and empathy. And then there are the critical and advocacy approaches, uh, focusing on the fact that the world as it is now is not um, the way it should be. So focusing on transformation, um, making um, certain goals a reality. So for instance, linking education to injustice or poverty. And then there are many other approaches. There are neoconservative approaches. There are Ignatian approaches dating back to medieval Catholic education. There are Buddhist approaches um, in, in Japan, for instance. Uh, Soka Gakkai has a uh, Ikeda has, has a pedagogy that is very much about global citizenship, um, eco-pedagogical approaches. So 
the problem with global citizenship education is it very much depends on who you're talking to um, in order to find out what, what it really means in that particular place at that particular time. So this is a slide. Well, you can have a look at it later when you look back at the recording, but there are many um, differences between the underlying theories, the perspective on globalization. So at the moment, as you may know, there are strong deglobalizing tendencies in, in many parts of the world. Um, there are critical uh, voices that are also anti-globalization, but they're, they're pro-international solidarity, so they're different from the deglobalizers. -glo and then you have, of course, the, the ultra-globalizers. So uh, linking to different conceptions of global citizenship, types of education, what kind of knowledge should be addressed and what kind of skills etc so these differences don't make it easier if your goal is well let's introduce global citizenship education uh, in my school or university um, and then you'd see that some people want to introduce this change softly or more radically and, and softly means that you infuse or mainstream elements of global citizenship education in your curriculum the ones that fit best and so small steps iterative you focus a lot on teacher training uh, give teachers a toolbox with teaching and learning activities that they could use um, often focusing on a whole institution approach so that it's not only about the curriculum but it is the entire institution that should send out the message that uh, global citizenship is valued uh, so also focusing on the co-curriculum or extracurricular activities um, and promoting interdisciplinary collaboration. More radical um, than it's about transdisciplinary education. So you move away from the context of your institution and you try to connect with the outside world and uh, establish a dialogue with, with the local community. Social emotional learning and effective pedagogies are um, um, yeah, be, become more prominent, um, which in our part of the world is challenging if you're in higher education, because the focus is, has always been a very much about cognitive learning and not so much about, uh, say, personal development, attitude, values and virtues. Um, focusing on collective than, rather than individual approaches. Um, here in Northwestern Europe, we're kind of yeah we, we have a individualist culture and um this with neoliberal people mean that the, the problems of the world um the solutions for the problems of the world are often uh, located in individual behavior so making um individual students entrepreneurial or um more resilient towards certain uh, developments or uh, focusing on behavior change for instance uh, to to address some of these issues rather than for instance uh, uh, focusing on on systems change um, education is also very much an individual effort uh, usually students are individually assessed on the extent to which they make progress during their education uh, and in this uh, approach, of course, the more historical analysis and power relations are, are um, very much at the heart of education because uh, the idea is that, that students are made aware of uh, yeah, um, inequalities and um, states of affairs that, that need to be addressed in order to uh, promote a, a better future. So then what competencies would a student need to develop to become a global citizen? Well, traditionally, people think it's it's very much about uh, boundary crossing and knowing how to, um, how to be interculturally competent. For instance, uh, when you look at this map of the world, you can see that um, there are there are large differences in terms of um, how people will probably address problems depending on whether they have survival values or self-expression values like in northwestern europe or whether they have traditional or secular values and the no awareness of these differences and this distance 
is of course something that you can start learning in school but it's a lifelong project basically um but um intercultural competence is only one part of of what determines whether or not you feel like a global citizen at the moment the difference between nations are not that great we're living in the age of of super diversity who we are what we think is important is not only dependent on what country we were born in we take so much in from other cultures via media um we um we have well social economic status whether uh, uh gender there, there are many ways in which what we feel the 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 identity that we develop will develop because of many different influences so and that fits with what is happening when you look at higher education because if you look at lifespan psychology what drives us when you're a toddler it's becoming autonomous when you're in midlife it's about generativity it's about what will i leave for further gen future generations but so between uh, 17 and 24 it's emerging adulthood identity is the most important thing that is on the minds of students it's uh, when they look for yeah what people call a, a narrative identity the, the story that you tell yourself uh, in relation to the world um, that fits with what you've experience until that age and what you think you will experience and the idea is that that identity will provide you with with uh, a sense of unity with with purpose and meaning and will be a very important driver of um, who you will become your motivation um, and this is also being recognized as something that is missing in higher education this focus on um what is it that we give students? I mean, it's, it's nice to present them with a diploma, which shows that they've passed numbers of tests and developed a, a knowledge base. But the most important thing would be to ask students 15 years after they graduate, what is it that um, determined that you came out on top in life, uh, that you flourished, and then you come with uh, yeah you see that there are notions like identity and agency and purpose that um, should be addressed in higher education and um, this leads to well-being and if, as you know well-being is one of student well-being is one of the major concerns nowadays in uh, education uh, in higher education I suppose elsewhere as well um, so focusing on issues like uh, purpose and, and uh, uh, identity agency is uh, the idea that we give students the life transformative skills um, that prepare them for the world that is to come. So that is something that is um, not very present in university education at the moment. So um, one other thing to focus on. Um, fits also with pedagogies of cooperation and, and solidarity again there the idea that students are at the center and that their purposes um, should be recognized when they are embarking on their learning journey um, fits with latin american pedagogies uh, and um, no wonder that in this document by unesco about reimagining the futures they mentioned this interdisciplinary problem oriented collaborative learning as, as a, a way to help um, to, to give students a learning environment where they can uh, share these um, um, these notions. Um, interdisciplinary problem oriented collaborative learning is is uh, at the moment becoming popular under the names of problem based learning or challenge based learning. Uh, sometimes uh, community engaged learning um the the yeah collaborative problem oriented interdisciplinary um, um variations on on the traditional classroom are uh, are very motivating and they allow students to gather skills that will become very important in in the in the world of the future so once one thing I need to add about these competencies is um, 
it not only depends on where you ask the question, what do you need to become a global citizen? I mean, if you are in, um, in the USA, you get a very different answer than when you're in Indonesia or in Latin America or, uh, um, or for that matter, in Northwestern Europe. Uh, but it also depends on when you ask the question because the world is changing rapidly. And with that, the notion of what a global citizen should be able to, to do or be also changes I and mean, this is a picture uh, showing an overview of the literature uh, on global citizenship education what kind of concepts are being used uh, especially in, in the, the teacher education uh, literature and uh, 20 years ago it would be very much about pedagogy but also about intercultural competence about language nowadays what you see is what is colored in blue here there's uh, a lot more attention to um, outdoor education, sustainable development, um, and well, that kind of um, is is showing that uh, in 10 years time, this figure might be very different. It might be that there are all, all sorts of digital competencies needed, given the way that AI is developing, for instance. So um, what is a global citizen? Well, it's a contested concept. It depends on your ideology, the place where you are, when you ask the questions and who you're asking the question. And then probably also in what uh, educational phase you're asking. For instance, uh, this is a picture from uh, UNESCO Forum of Education on Sustainable Development and Global Citizenship. They looked at um, what terms are used um, in pre-primary education, primary education, lower secondary education, and upper secondary education that link to education for sustainable development and global citizenship education. And you see that over the course of uh, a young person's life, emphasis on cognitive learning is increasing, on social and emotional learning is decreasing, and on behavioral learning, it st remains steady at a, a low level. But then again, it depends on where in the world you're looking at education. And for instance, in Sweden and most North Northwest European countries, uh, it's mostly cognitive learning. In Kenya, it's mostly social emotional learning. Um, in Mexico, this is what you, I think is kind of representative of, of the average. But in Japan, there is a lot of behavioral learning. And again, if you want to implement global citizenship education, you have to contextualize it. You have to realize that certain approaches will work that will not work in other places of the world. And um, yeah, that's one of the things that make it difficult to start. And, and um, when you ask people to start thinking about education for sustainable development or global citizenship education, usually they start with competency frameworks or, or documents that help them make a start. Like for instance, a couple of months ago, signed the recommendation on education for peace and human rights, international understanding, cooperation, fundamental freedoms, global citizenship and sustainable development. There you get 14 guidelines on the things that we should focus on in education, like human rights, uh, advancing gender equality, uh, promoting dialogue between cultures and generations, etc. So the, these are some guidelines that will help you consider what you might be changing in your education. Uh, and with it, there are learning objectives. The, we, we want students to develop citizenship skills, anticipatory skills, self-awareness, analytical and critical thinking, etc. That's um, one really influential text. Um, so similarly, there are documents for, um, say, education for sustainable development. And then as soon as you start reading these, the matters complicate. For instance, the overlap between education for sustainable development and global citizenship education is huge. It's very difficult to make a distinction between one both with 
there are of course differences the focus on identity uh, human rights is more prominent in global citizenship education for instance um, but before you know it there will be people advancing what they think is a global citizenship education agenda while others will press for education for sustainable development and in an organization like a university before you know it there are different committees that each try to make changes and um, get in each other's way rather than working together so that is one of the lessons that we've learned there are many people uh, with best attentions trying to make changes in curricula um, but the people who are uh, really involved in the day-to-day -day changes are overloaded with requests from different people who say we want to pay more attention to sustainable development, to diversity, equity and inclusion, to global citizenship, to um, uh, entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, etc. Um, and then yeah, back to the teacher, there are many of these reference frameworks. For instance, this is one reference framework of competences for democratic culture. You can see the relevance for global citizenship education. Um, you, you should realize he's here we have knowledge and skills and attitudes and values. But in the end, you can still wonder what will happen to the person who is developing these knowledge and skills and attitudes and values. Uh, if you know uh, uh, Geert Bista, um, he'll say, well, this does, you can design your education to make sure that people will end up with the knowledge, the skills, attitudes and values that in this case are needed to, um, to thrive in a democratic culture. But you still won't know whether you you uh, your student ends up as a Rosa Parks or uh, an Adolf Eichmann. So what kind of person is developing? And this is uh, his plea against uh, the learnification of education. Well, these reference frameworks, there are many of them. Um, and yeah, it's good to know that they're there and you can consult them. but. Often they're not the best way to start change because teachers will think, OK, this is another box ticking exercise. I just have something to to make sure that is delivered in my education, um, but their heart is not in it. So where to start? We, we took a, a slightly different approach. Uh, Maastricht University, by the way, it's the European, European University of the Netherlands, the most international university. We have 22,000 students. 57% are international and 2400 staff, 46% international, close to the German and Belgian borders, which accounts for some of this internationalization. Um, but rather than giving them um, a competence framework, we wanted teachers to come up with their own. So give them framing agency. And that starts with the question, what is our ideal graduate? So what are the, the qualities that we would like to see in our graduates? So for instance, here was a group came up with a, a sorting exercise and then decided curiosity is the most important. Having change agent skills is the next one. Then inter and transdisciplinary skills, perspective taking and a sense of purpose. Well, this way um, we got, um, well, there are exercises where where my teachers just looked at pictures and said, this is a picture that for me symbolizes global citizenship education. We asked them to label them, uh, assign words, and we clustered the words. And then we um, used the, the existing literature to make three categories. For instance, this is uh, an article which says the best way to, to uh, look at global citizenship is that it's about social responsibility global competence and civic engagement. And ideally, all three should be ple pre pleasant if present if we want to develop the global leaders of tomorrow. Yeah. If we only have someone who is global com globally competent but doesn't feel responsible or cannot engage, then you get some indifferent elite. And um, if you have someone who is um, civically engaged but not globally competent not feeling responsible you get 
activists who are non-informed, etc. So ideally, they should all be there. Um, we asked people to contextualize this, and we ended up with what we call a hospitable framework. Uh, major dimensions, global literacy, systems thinking, social responsibility and transformative engagement with knowledge elements in light blue, skills in orange and attitudes, values, virtues in dark blue. And with this, the teachers could look at their own programs and see what was already in there and where they would like to take next steps to make certain qualities more visible in their teaching and learning. Yeah. The uh, it can be summarized, so it's about understanding today's complex problems and being able to see different perspectives and be inclusive, having a sound moral compass and be empathic, feeling the responsibility for betterment of the world, and transformative engagement, the ability to make change happen. This shows that in a university where you have different disciplines, different faculties, um, global citizenship or these different qualities can be present to a different extent. Because, for instance, in the faculty of psychology, psychological science is very much focused on on the individual. Um, it's, it's by its nature uh, very different from, for instance, uh, uh, the social science where um, we have studies like global Global studies, European studies, um, there are studies like international business, um, where this global dimensions is, is very much part and parcel of, of the curriculum already. So depending on where you start, you will take different first steps. But the important thing here is, of course, that you are able to learn from each other and hopefully see good examples in other places and, and see to what extent you can embed them in your own education. Toolboxes, once teachers know where to start, they will um, they have plenty of places to look for good examples. I mean, um, what Gibson already once said is uh, uh, the future is already out there, is just not very evenly distributed. So if you want to look for good examples of how things work, look around um, and and yeah, you'll, you'll find this. I mean, there are loads of books that can help you find ideas on how to um, make changes that align with wherever you're, you're going. Um, but that's one way to look at it. And the other way is, of course, to look what is already happening within your institution, because especially if it's large, most people will only know what's happening in their own program and have very... Uh, uh, dim views of what's happening elsewhere. So sharing good ideas is also something that we do, which is why there's a website where all this material is, is being shared. You'll see the link at the end. OK, key challenges. Um, lofty ideas, as I said, but teachers have, have their fixed duties in terms of, uh, well, we have a certain curriculum to run. We have um, external bodies checking whether the quality of our graduates is is up to standard, etc. What will happen if you ask them to embed this in their education? So the first worry is how do we build global citizenship education into what is already there? We have intended learning outcomes, and how do we balance the new ones with the old ones? Should we leave something out? Ideally not. So how, how can we make these changes? Uh, how can we foster interdisciplinary perspectives? How can we create more real world links? How can we address the local and the global? How can we make sure that these collective goals rather than individual goals are prioritized? And how do we assess? Um, so when we go along, we see loads of different solutions to these questions. I'll mention I'll give a few example examples. Um, you can read them in detail later, but this is an example of a, a design thinking project where during a semester, a group of students work together on a problem offered by an external stakeholder, but teaching is done by a team of teachers from different programs. So it is interdisciplinary. 
when you get a lecture, the lecture is given by more than one teacher from different faculties who give different perspectives on the program. And um, um, yeah, ideally, in the first couple of weeks, students read about the problem and start defining it and then looking for ideas uh, which they eventually will communicate. And in this case, they come up with um, a debate on some contentious topic and organize a panel discussion uh, that gives a marginalized group a voice. And so the, the theme here is tolerance and beliefs. And every half year, there is a new theme where students work together in small groups guided by a group of interdisciplinary teachers. Um, this is another example, an interdisciplinary minor in sustainability. Um, this is a way of getting out there. This is where uh, secondary school students work together with master students focusing on sustainable development goals and going into the outskirts of Maastricht, the city, looking for ways to make changes that um, uh, align with the sustainable development goals. The interesting part here, of course, is, is it's not yet intergenerational learning, although, although uh, Generation Alpha is, I think, now approaching secondary education and our master students are still Generation Z, but um, it's good that these links, they, these between types of um, uh, education and uh, are going to progress because uh, well, one of the things that are going to happen soon is that these intergenerational tensions might might increase, and it's important to um, have the have, have people of different age groups to work together and, and thinking about these huge problems that the world is facing. Uh, this is an example of a challenge-based learning project where, again, students engage with. Uh, external stakeholders often this is from a global studies program elsewhere in the world. Some example questions are mentioned below, but the idea is you go through systems thinking, uh, sense based learning, just not not just focusing on the cognitive. Um, uh, reframing a challenge um, and then start prototyping and testing and again uh, following this design thinking method. Assessment, um, that's always the first thing, one of the first things that comes to come to mind of teachers. There, there are ways to um, yeah, challenge the challenge of assessing character is, is is it's not easy. I mean, as a psychologist, we know that there are ways to go about this, but it's difficult to do that when you are only focusing on, say, a period of eight weeks. Ideally, you are looking at longer stretches of time and, and there are uh, a competency based program where you have what we now call programmatic assessment and think about uh, this longitudinal learning arcs where things can develop, uh, where you can use rubrics to see whether this development has actually come about. Um, but there are answers there, but still it's a challenge. I mentioned, uh, yeah, curriculum often when you look at global citizenship education, people shy away from the curriculum because often it's it's a big fight to to make uh, to have an impact and and um, to make way for elements that are not already in a curriculum. So the best way to do something is when a curriculum is revised because then things become fluid and then you can can get major changes. Apart from that, the curriculum, is overemphasized. So the, the the environment of your institution is way more important to, to determine whether or not students develop this global citizenship identity, which has all these, uh, which is related to all sorts of positive things like value and diversity, intergroup empathy, um, helping behavior, etc. So apart from making salient that there are things in the curriculum that are changing. We're also making sure that students know that there are ways to become, to add to their life by, uh, for instance, becoming a volunteer by contributing in that way. Uh, so well, there's a portal where they can find where they can add value to the lives of others. Again, this is one of the thing that has a high impact on student well-being, knowing that what they do matters to others. So 
making sure that they can find opportunities is, is very much part of what we want to uh, promote. So the second challenge, the first one was how to bring it in the curriculum. The second one is explicitly about social emotional learning. Um, if you're in pre-primary education and primary education, you might wonder what, what the problem is because the, 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 it's social emotional learning is, is very much um, in the focus at that age. But once you're uh, reaching, uh, um, yeah, 18 to 24 category, um, we noticed that our teachers are not that well equipped to deal with things like conflict and controversy in the learning environment safe and brave spaces, how to deal with sexual transgressive behavior or racial microaggressions, um, how to picture that there are different sides of the social justice scale. Uh, in, in our universities, most students are fairly privileged, and if they are not, they are not showing uh, that they can feel vulnerable. Um, the idea that yeah developing an entrepreneurial self can make people feel like it's all up on them and that can be very overwhelming um if we fail to let them know that it's not their responsibility that the world is the way it is so making people more uh, resilient towards all this stress and anxiety related to climate for instance is is um is part of social emotional learning. And that is something that we also see elsewhere in the world. You see these life competencies becoming more prominent. Um, character education is, is in vogue. We have the sustainable development goals, but now there are also the inner development goals, which are very much about the social emotional competences that people would need to engage with these difficult problems of tomorrow um on the um top right you see the character strengths that that are uh, mentioned in positive psychology a link to a round and sense of sense of purpose so um it's something this transformational learning is 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 becoming more um um salient in in the minds of many in educational innovators and this is an example is Minerva. This is voted the most innovative university in 2023 and before. Also about global citizenship very much. Uh, students, they stay for a year in, in San Francisco and then for half a year, they move to another big city across the world where they uh, do projects with the local uh, population. Um, but there at that university, you can see there are explicit character outcomes. In this case, curiosity, empathy, resilience, etc. Um, you might think, OK, character, but isn't that something that's very stable? Um, well, it, it isn't. Our personality can change. Uh, this is an example where it's happening through digital coaching interventions. But, but you know, whether you're introvert or extrovert, uh, emotionally stable or more neurotic these are things that can be influenced by the environment um we can pretend that it doesn't but there are i mean look at how people engage with social media they can change in many ways and when we mention digital coaching i should just mention this uh we can't not mention ai nowadays but the way that we will engage with digital tools will will change a lot and um, the question is, what are these essential human activities for which, um, yeah, that will determine whether or not, or not we'll, we'll have a job in, in, in the future? And people talk about rehumanizing the world of work, that the, the questions like leadership, creativity, judgment, um, the, these are the, the things for which we will um, be rewarded later on in terms of not being replaced by AI. Um, and in addition, there, there are what people call fusion skills, which is about AI literacy, knowing exactly what how to deal with this uh, new machine intelligence. But um, for now, it's, it's most important to realize that the jobs of the future are expected to be very much relying on our ability to solve problems 
and on our interpersonal skills. So that means if we prepare students for the future, interpersonal skills and problem solving skills are, are very much, um, yeah, should be part of, of what we're aiming for in, in, in graduates. Yeah, so that was the second one. And the third and last one, preparing teachers for this type of education. So I mentioned these lofty ideals. Many teachers don't have the confidence to uh, address them. Uh, especially in, uh, in in academia, it's for many researchers difficult uh, to suddenly uh, engage with students at a social emotional level. Um, skills are missing, confidence are missing. So, um, well, we, we find that this framing agency is very important, so that teachers know that they don't have to tick boxes, but that they can look for ways to make sense of what we're trying to achieve and find solution that fits their practice. So baby steps sometimes. Creativity coaching, um, be more creative and think about who you are as a teacher. So uh, often, uh, especially in a university, uh, people are rewarded for research and not for teaching. All that creativity goes in their research and not in their teaching. And that's kind of a shame because the, there, there's a lot of resource, creative resources that are not um, used. So uh, explicit creativity coaching helps here. Communities of practice, of course, um, and facilitating co-creation among students and teachers is, is really important. And I'll show that in the next last few slides. Um, but self-reflection, again, is, is key. Who am I as an educator? Why do I teach? For what do I teach? Um, you see the get fly, by the way, that's Aristotle's picture of a teacher is either a, a midwife, a get fly or an electric eel. So someone who's kind of waking up the student and pointing to what is outside, what they should pay attention to. Um, and um, well, Again, this idea of character strengths and virtues, they not only matter for students, but they matter for teachers as well. So these exercises uh, would fit teacher training just as well. And um, and also this notion of teachers can be agents of social change. This is by Douglas Bourne. If you're interested, there is a network, an angel network, where you can find uh, a lot more information on um, global education and learning and how teachers can be involved there. Um, so last thing, student agency and co-creation. Uh, getting students in a place where they can decide what their education is about goes beyond just student-centered learning. Uh, it is really giving them the tools to actually develop and design and or co-design their, their education. And um, so this is not just about student voice, uh, hearing about what students feel about the program and then doing something about it, but actually making them agents for change. Um, this is working out exceptionally well with topics like diversity, equity and inclusion and with sustainability, where we hear that students are, are way more committed to um, um, having changes made in their education than some of the teachers are. Uh, this is an example, Red House Georgetown, where you see that students work on things like designing for racial justice, uh, conflict transformation, um, but there are many others. This is in, in uh, Finland, a student-led hub where a sustainability education is being uh, offered. Um, and this is uh, in Maastricht and a problem and uh, just a group of students deciding we're going to make our own elective on psychology of climate change because it is missing in the curriculum and uh, we know what to do. So they designed it, they implemented it and delivered it themselves. And the interesting thing is then that you see that they focus on different elements than I as a teacher would have focused on. So in that respect, it, uh, it was a, a great success. All right, so we started with the future. This is a, a quote I, I picked up on one of uh, uh, one earlier presentation. We end with the future. It's about hope. Uh, teaching is a radical act of hope. 
It's an assertion of faith in a better future in an increasingly uncertain and fraught present, a commitment to that future, even if we can't clearly discern its shape. Um, and hope and critical hope is, is something that also, when we talk about global citizenship education, is a, a quality that we, we hope to strive for. All right, and that was my presentation. Um, the link here is the link to where we try to collect everything that is happening in terms of global citizenship education here at Maastricht. You're welcome to have a look. And for now, um, I'd like to leave it at that. Um, and if there are any questions, um, feel free to ask. Thank you very much, Herko, for uh, this uh, interesting webinar. Uh, please feel free uh, to share any questions, any thoughts. If uh, if there aren't any questions so far, uh, maybe I, I would like to highlight something that uh, I found super interesting. And I, for some people might be very obvious, but uh, I I have never thought that for creating a global citizen, you have to uh, enhance all the com the competence areas, let's say, of the students in order to have a um, in order to create a global citizen. You have to enhance uh, the necessary uh, competence areas, and uh, that that's what I found very uh, important and very. I haven't, I have, I hadn't thought of that, and uh, thank you <laughs> also for uh, sharing this information. And uh, I don't know if I sound uh, a bit stupid now, but um, it makes total sense. <laughs> but for me, no, but, but, but yes, <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll give an example of how difficult it sometimes is. We we have a faculty where uh, with programs uh, that are very much on global citizenship in a way, in, in that students read books on these big international problems. And I, I noticed that when I talk to the, the teachers who are academics, th they feel uh, education is very much about what's happening between my head and the book that is in front of me and getting that inside the head. And that's where the responsibility of the teacher ends. Um, for students, that's not exactly how it's experienced. So when you ask students, they want to have meaningful experiences outside the walls of, of the university and, and to actually do something with all this knowledge that suggests that the world is not the way it should be. And 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 that part, this this engagement that calls for something more than just critical thinking, that, that calls for a uh, an attitude uh, and, and other types of skills and and the ability to engage with other people and so that's i think what what is for some people at least at university level is really important i can imagine that in primary education and secondary education there there are lots of unesco network uh, unesco network schools will will have other issues to deal with so but this was just a story of uh, academia and um for better or for worse, it's what you have to deal with. You have to make it fit your reality and not rely on recipes. But I mean, the different grades of education, they are connected. So an issue that exists in, uh, in higher education, for example, it can be also met in primary and secondary, maybe in a smaller um, Maybe, yeah, maybe it might be smaller, but it doesn't mean that it won't exist. Uh, it cannot oh, yeah. exist in the other grades as well. Yes. No, I mean, that's, of course, the, one of the, the, the biggest challenges. I mean, for Maastricht University, with lots of international students, we noticed that the backgrounds of the students are so very different and the expectations of what they're going to see when once they start their studies here widely differ. Uh, um, and and yeah, of course they adapt because young people adapt like crazy. Um, 
but at the same time, I mean that there are issues like, for instance, the the COVID crisis that has has really hit uh, um, well-being, but also things like like literacy. I mean, the the, the PISA outcomes where you show that reading uh, competence is 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 dropping. Uh, I don't know what I mean. If if you're a positive person, you might think, okay, but there's something that is replacing reading, and people no longer need uh, language, but they have other means to to communicate. Uh, who knows? But for now, it worries us a lot because the the text that we usually prescribe or, or suggest to students uh, suddenly have become really impenetrable, and um, yeah, that's. Um, Fortunately, they have ChatGPT to help them, but uh, but then again, what's what's being replaced by ChatGPT? Uh, we'll have to see. And we're really curious to see what will happen when Generation Alpha, so the ones that were born around 2010, will enter uh, the university. The, the the digital first generation will will when they have a question will not go to a human being, but will they'll they'll consult uh, AI. Um, it's an interesting world, but... Um... Indeed, we, we just uh, received a question about AI. Uh, if you think that artificial intelligence uh, can be a powerful and beneficial tool for global citizenship education? Yeah, there, there are people who think that, um, but then you have to think about planetary intelligence. So you can say that human intelligence and machine intelligence together might be just enough to solve these really big problems. I mean, there are alien types of artificial intelligence that can solve problems that no human being can solve. And there's this program called Alpha Fold that, that has learned to solve problems in, in um, uh, um, um, how to, to structure molecules, I think, of proteins. But things that go beyond our capacity. So in an ideal world, you might hope that together there will be enough planetary intelligence to really avert all these disasters that um, uh, that people are, uh, are, are suggesting that we were heading towards. But whether that happens, I mean, the downside, the AI will, will um, Enlarge inequality, probably. So uh, it, it might be that these great solutions are not for everyone. And then, um, in terms of global citizenship, we're, we're, we're failing miserably because of uh, the digital divide. But yeah. Yes, basically, this is a very big conversation uh, about AI and the potentials and the possible threats. Yeah, and uh, maybe yeah. we could tackle it in the future in another webinar who knows the, yeah you should do that in another webinar because, right so yeah. um at this point maybe we can conclude i would like uh, to thank you uh mr von der Inpun, for being here with us today so um we have an upcoming uh, online course on uh, the european school education platform it concerns digital citizenship education and democratic participation it will be launched it will start basically on the 5th of february and uh, feel free to navigate through the platform to see the more upcoming events and uh, we would like to thank you all for your input uh, and your comments thank you for being here with us today i uh, thank you herko for making us the honor to be here with us and um, we it was hope a pleasure. to see you soon Thank okay. you, thank you so much. Uh, my colleague Marta has uh, shared with you um, the survey, which we, we, we kindly invite you to fill in and give us your feedback about this webinar. Um, have a nice evening, everyone. We hope to see you soon again. And uh, thank you.